May I now request you to please put your mobile phones on the manner mode, so much Ruchi. Dr. Bhanuman Nanavati College of Architecture for Women is an institute operating under the aegis of Maharshi Karve's Sri Shikshan Samstha. It's a 121-year-old parent body dedicatedly working towards emancipation of women through education. This organization was founded in 1896 by the great missionary and social worker Bharat Ratna Maharshi Dhondo Keshav Karve. Maharshi Karve was a visionary who questioned age-old dogmas of social ostracization of widows and chose to reform the system through education. The legacy of questioning is what we value in our academia. In today's knowledge economy, we realize that it is questioning that is of fundamental importance than just learning. Because learning is increasingly happening through rich, fertile, open source mediums. BNC believes that tomorrow's solutions will come only when we break away from dogmas and question them collaboratively to ask what else could be done. To ensure this, BNCA has a resource bandwidth of faculties and resources ranging from heritage conservation and management to digital architecture. And this exactly promotes a discourse in this academia. We always facilitate such programs where we call people with different opinions on this platform because there should be exchange and questioning. At the perimeter of this exchange, we help will emerge an innovative discourse that would offer some unexpected new conduits which will change the trajectory of architectural education for sure. We are visually starting our year by the AP Karmendi Lecture Series, where in this year, we have the honor of hosting the prolific architect and architect theorist, Patrick Schumacher. We are honored to have an avant-garde architect who is also worthy recipient of extensive media coverage. Patrick himself is admired for his crisp criticism of our profession's weakness and more importantly, strong proponent of questioning the established dogmas. We welcome you, Patrick, and also welcome Mr. Milin Khade and architect Paolo Matuzzi, Associates of Zahadi Architects Latin. Before we proceed, I would like to invite architect Sujata Kabe, course coordinator of the environmental department, to lay down the preamble of the lecture series and its progress since its inception. Thank you, Dhanashree. Uh, as you all know, I'll give a very brief introduction to the series. The AP Kanvindi lecture series was started in the memory of uh, one of India's greatest contemporary architects, architect Achit Kanvindi, in the year 2009. So this is the ninth lecture in this series that we are having. It has been our constant effort to bring to you eminent architects from across the globe to talk to you about various aspects of architecture as well as young professionals. To get a very short glimpse of our past, the first year was marked by an inaugural lecture by uh, the stalwart of architecture, architect B.B. Doshi, followed by architect Karan Grover in the next year. The year after was another remarkable one when the students witnessed the works of architect Madhav Doshi and architect Kamal Malik, followed by the sensitive and creative architect Brinda Somaya from Mumbai. In 2012, our invitee was architect Akhtar Chauhan from Mumbai. In 13, 2013, we had a session with uh, architect K. Jaisen from Bangalore, followed in the next year by architect Sanjay Mohe. Last year, we had a very interesting dialogue with Dr. Johannes Vidoro from NUS Singapore. And this year, we are indeed honored <coughs> to have with us architect Patrick Schumacher. This, uh, this program not only brings to the, seat, uh, to the students a series of lectures, but also strives to go a step ahead in the process. Under this uh, innovative educational enlighten enlightenment program, in the first year, BNCA established the Wall of Fame in the memory of architect Achyut Kanbinde, the first of its kind in India. In 2009, uh, BNCA published Achyut Kanbinde, a Kanbinde commemoration volume, edited by architect Shadya Dhongde and architect Chetan Sarasarbudde, followed by a book written by Professor Arun Ogle titled Chidakash Ghatakash. In 2011, we also published Temples, Vadas and Institutions of Pune, a Legacy and Symbolism in Architecture, written by Senior Professor G.K. Kanhade. 
followed by a book written by uh, by engineer Sanjay Deshpande, Shades of Grey and Green. In a view to, in a view to do something remarkable every year, 2013 was the year we established a VNCI archive of Indian architecture, Vastu Kala Kosh, which is a collection of sketches, drawings, photographs, correspondences, videos, and articles concomitant to various works in Indian architecture since the 1950s. We hope to see you all in the 10th lecture or in this series, which will happen next year. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Sujata. May I now please request our visionary principal, Dr. Anurag Kashyap, to please come on the stage and address the gathering. Dr. Kashyap is the person who, through his untiring aspirations, has brought in about a constant and accelerating change in our academia, <coughs> making it the most enviable institute to be part of. Dr. Kashyap. Today, you are going to witness my biggest speech and longest speech. I welcome the God of Digital Architecture. And his fortunate and very lucky team who got the opportunity to work with Patrick. Architect Milin Khade, Architect Paolo Matuzzi, and uh, Vishu. So I welcome them all and thank you so much. Good evening, welcome everybody. And first of all, thanks, thank you to the school for having me, to bringing me here. And thank you so much for all the warm welcoming, all the nice rituals. And to get a glimpse of the school, the school's founder and the nice fab lab and the new robot. Very impressive. I have to start there. No, no. Okay. No time limitation, so great. That's, I really like that. So I will give the lecture I gave yesterday at the 361 conference, which was uh, an interesting conference, and we had an interesting interaction afterwards. So I will talk about Permatism 2.0. Originally I started to talk about Permatism in 2007 and then published for the Venice Biennale 2008 a manifest writing a series of co-protagonist colleagues and students and ex-students to present work at the Biennale. So when Permatism, the phrase was introduced, the movement was already going for over a decade and perhaps longer. And recently this is just Last year I've put together an issue of AD, Architectural Design, which is a very important theoretical organ for the movement and has been for prior movements equally important for deconstructivism as well as postmodernism, where I'm gathering the current crop of, I would say, key protagonists, but also I wanted to put a mark down that I think we are moving into mature phase of parametricism. We're still experimenting, we're still researching, but we also have major projects complete and many more on our drawing boards and we just start arguing for what I call the social functionality of parametricism. So we need to shift the emphasis from technical functionality to social functionality and that's the emphasis of this particular issue I mean, when we started to work with digital tools, we were just playing around initially to warm up a kind of muscle flexing, seeing what kind of geometries one could generate, and over the years, gradually, we started to burden these forms with function, but also we started looking at their structural implications and fabrication implications. And that has been taking a lot of time and effort and energy and in the meantime, what was only intuitively clear that the new versatility, adaptive capacity, malleability of these methodologies and ways of working have a significant uh, contribution to urbanism and architecture to play in terms of social functionality. 
So I want to, in that lecture, I will talk about a number of issues, address a number of issues which go beyond Pramatism itself. So I will talk about urbanism in, in the end. And what we can witness around the world is that paradox of sameness, apparent sameness, um, kind of homogeneity of global urban development, which is based, I would argue, on too much difference. So there's a paradox. Uh, these cities are all different, they're individual in many ways, each building is individual, but in their accumulation they cancel each other out and become nearly like a garbage spill. So we will talk about this and trying to address that with the methodology of parametricism. I think what is very important to look at, uh, there is one precursor to parametricism which I recognize, and that's the German architect engineer Frei Otto who has pioneered the use of form-finding techniques where we don't invent form but allow form to be generated through an equilibrium of forces with material models as simulations where form is taking, architecture is taking shape and we have now transposed that, these kind of processes into digital simulation techniques. And it's very important to see that as a kind of magic high performance in these structures. And that the curvature we invested in and we love so much is of course high performance materiality. And that we are over the, across the world more invested in rectilinear structures has more to do with our limitations than with an underlying rationality. So the is an argument I make, but also not only in terms of structure and, and the lightness we can achieve, but the complexity of urban relationships lead to these kind of more this complex uh, building in Seoul, which mediates a very irregular shape, multiple levels of entry, multiple institutions collected, and the way we use curvature is in fact to make this complexity navigable and legible. So one of my slogans is maintaining legibility in the face of societal and urban complexity. Because it's very elegant and easy to find one's way and still it's very, very, um, let's say, irregular in its pieces. And I will also show some examples of this um, where we looking at the new technologies to connect up with historical traditions and different cultural traditions and develop a cultural sensitivity but this has also its own reason and rationale because we can look around and find in the vernaculars of this world uh, a lot of design intelligence which evolved rather than being consciously deployed like intelligences of organisms, so there's a parallel between biomimicry and learning from nature. We can have the same learning trajectory with respect to um, learning from the vernaculars of this world in terms of particularly how to adapt to different climates and how to make the most of various materials and resources um, where at, in a historical evolutionary process. Uh, I will also talk about new typologies which I think are emerging in a high density <coughs> urban environment. This is an example. In the recent tower we've sketched and designed and nearly all of our towers are now hollow. There are large atriums where we talk about connecting all the events and there could be many different events to make them inter-visible, inter-aware and interconnected. I want to give you a few hints about modernism because parametricism is succeeding modernism as an epochal style marking a new era, socio-economic era and technological era in the developing world civilization. Modernism was already a global style recognizing 
the previous stage of world civilization, which I call the Fordist era of mechanical mass reproduction, which had also its political and social consequences in socialism, perhaps, and social democratic centrally planned economy. Um, and, but now we're in a different era. But what I find striking about modernism is uh, the fact that we have, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, when the technologies had already accumulated, which means industrial production processes, uh, steel and concrete, and also a new scale of operation, that uh, there was a theoretical anticipation an expectation that a new architectural style would have to come be brought about and this is Le Corbusier's writing from the 1920s but there was actually earlier writings leading to this from somebody like for instance Otto Wagner or Thesius and others who had <coughs> uh, theoretically anticipated what's coming and I think that's very important that we can do that and that we can then have theoretical projects like the Ville Radieuse from the Corbusier, 1924. And this is only a very small group of people at the time. Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, for instance, as the core protagonist, maybe Theo van Doesberg, but the three I mentioned were actually coming, met each other in one office in Berlin, and the manifestos were articulated even before the war. And then there was a kind of Rollout in anticipation, a, a huge success story where during their lifetime they could witness in the 60s that uh, modern architecture had transformed the physiognomy of this planet around the world. Of course, architecture, but also industrial design, the totality of the world of artifacts as well as the built environments around the world. And in nine, around the 60s, everybody in the world was a modernist, and that had its own importance and interest, but research and development continued under the principles of modernism. And for me that is a great example for parents. Of course we're in a very different stage. This, these set of principles are no longer adequate. And for me it's just an example how something can be radically thought through and then anticipate and become a success. The same as um, with Mies van der Rohe's sketch of a office skyscraper 1922 in Berlin. There's a, in the 50s, the execution of the Seagram's Tower in uh, New York. You can see how it contrasts with the architecture of its day and then how it transformed the whole of Manhattan or half of Manhattan in its image. I think again it's very important that an initial marginal position thought through and aligned with the historical forces of world civilization is, where is becoming successful. And for instance, the whole of Chicago was rebuilt and was developed in the image of Mies van der Rohe's anticipations. Um, so parametrism, I want to argue, is on the same trajectory. Um, and we are in that trajectory. So, so when this was published in 2008, 2009, we already well underway. We had already reached uh, a significant group of protagonists, young architects in different universities, small experimental buildings, and then and a series of medium to large buildings were already underway. So, um, and now we, of course, we still haven't seen the breakthrough uh, which the modernists had seen in the post-war era. And, but like the disruption of modernism through the Second World War, I would argue we have been, our progress has been somewhat disrupted through the financial crisis, the European stagnation, the European debt crisis, uh, the Arab Spring and many other political situations which have slowed us down and I hope we're coming out of this into a new era of rolling out on some of them and generalizing the insights. So in Parallelism 2.0 I'm showing that 
there's a whole range of scales all the way from products even fashion um, to furniture interiors various buildings and urbanism which is brought under the spell of a new set of principles which are aligned with what I call the post fortis network society which is in a sense empowered by the microelectronic revolution and by computational intelligence uh, which has been transforming um, science, engineering and should be much more transforming design as well as transforming all our lives, our productive lives through robotic manufacturing with all the new adaptive capacities, diversity, fast innovation cycles which dynamizes society in an exciting and th a thrilling way and we should as architects participate in that. So these are just a few examples. I will not talk too much about example by example. I just want to point at some of those larger scale achievements where we have the diversity of spaces and the complexity of interactions or a range of phenotypical variations of a genotypical station. So we're no longer in the era of repeating a model, but in an era of having a parametric model which adapts itself to different conditions, taking shape and making itself uh, more integrated and adaptively optimized through different conditions. And this delivers a new aesthetic. These new capacities have morphological consequences. So for me, beauty and the, we need to also <coughs> acquire new aesthetic sensibilities to be uh, in tuned with and aligned with our sensibilities with the potentials of new technologies and design capacities. And for me, beauty has always been and will always be a promise of performance. And of course, we looking at changing and shifting ideals of beauty. This has to do with different social roles, perhaps. We're expecting, for instance, also of uh, uh, ourselves, but also of our environments. So we have, we have to be aware of the historical relativity of ideals of beauty. And they recognize different eras, different technological eras, but also different socioeconomic and social eras with different cultures. And what might have been a vision very discomforting and menacing, a kind of vision of hell, like the prison visions of Piranesi in the culture we series, becomes a kind of thrilling potential, namely a deep, ambiguous, open space which unfolds in all directions endlessly, where space uh, is open and flows above, below, and all around in layers, offering information, offering visual stimulation, unfolding so many uh, opportunities of interaction and offerings in an urban space. So nearly that space of uh, free-floating drift. We've been speculating about such images to have a fully three-dimensionalized immersive environment in which we make connections, this idea of a 24-7 network society, network connections, so if, if a series of companies of one of those conglomerates, for instance, so, uh, would inhabit thousands of people inhabiting a new building, they should be aware of each other's projects and be visually connected and be, for the sake of skill and knowledge, exchanges, synergies, cooperative potentials, etc. So, um, our buildings fit into a given context. It's not about a tabula rasa condition, but it's about densifying and intensifying and building up the city in layers, like in the Rome project, to have coherency between exterior and interior, and to have that space of continuously movement and variation, but at certain moments there's intensification and then it's calming down again, but there's a continuous ever-changing drift and shift in the, in the spatial conditions. And this is some of our early works 
where you can see the open up the section. It's all about porosity and three-dimensional connection where, where there is complexity, but there is navigability. You can follow a trajectory where you can make choices and where a facade already gives clues about the internal organization structure and where there's lines and guiding vistas which make the complexity available to users who will be browsing uh, in a freely uh, self-directed roaming condition. You, but you can already see that this is, for instance, a library building and a student center. It's actually two parts which are color-coded, the library in dark, the student center parts in a building, and they're intermeshed. You can already guess that the main reading room is up, up there, a destination for you to find and then a kind of series of important orientation spaces where many things become intervisible, where natural light is guiding you through and where the tilt which dynamizes the whole always gives you a direction out or deeper into the building so there is orienting capacity in these manipulations and here you can see that we always use natural light for primary uh, circulation and deep vistas are important even when you go into circulation space you remain visually connected so you don't get lost when you turn corners etc and these are very, very important spaces where you see in all directions deep layers you even connect back to the exterior and the sense of orientation is maintained and then to look back into the campus so this goes for a lot of our spaces and they could be quite different materialities and atmospheres but they all share and participate in a new unified language uh, of the project where um, certain rules and principles unfold and offer up the uh, multitude of offerings which are brought to you and for me architecture is an interface of communication and um, a bridge like this becomes also a, a, an adaptive element which lacks symmetry because the conditions are asymmetric there's a kind of touchdown point halfway or two-thirds through the through the river and an entrance point is different from an exit point as the exit participates in the expo for instance so um, I'm not going to talk too much but for instance even a tower like this is actually a school of architecture so it must be very communicative uh, there's a very complex ground condition the building nestles into it, multiple levels multiple conditions and you can actually move underneath on the outdoor there's some paths through the building there's a series of three, four atria inside and a series of terraces to step out on to connect back with the rest of the campus. Or connecting again new to old and using tensile structures, dimension, dimensionless uh, material structure uh, using curvature uh, to give structural performance and using ideas like the column which becomes at the same time a high point and light, natural light well into such a building. Mobile art pavilion, so a super light structure with fiberglass and fabric which was then shipped around and moved from Tokyo to sorry from Hong Kong to Tokyo to Manhattan and Paris. And again such a building where we like to integrate exterior and interior, parkscapes and um, then in fact um, three institutions, there's the, uh, the each mark with a kind of peak, there's a national library, uh, there's a museum, then there's a concert hall, each sponsoring different exterior spaces, different silhouette, a different um, face, but also belonging to one unified entity, so there's unity cross difference and the differentiation of a unified body and a central atrium with, where these three uh, institutions fuse and you also get a lot of vistas again 
from the outside, <coughs> from the inside through the outside back into the inside, in fact. And then we, when we shift level and add staircases or lighting, we try to do this for the sake of visual re complexity reduction uh, to, to maintain legibility in the face of social complexity. We, we like to integrate features out of a single formalism, if you like, um, and to have complexity across levels again. And um, again, you see the deep vistas in layers, the way the, the building unfolds, and also a shift of atmosphere from, from the white public lobby spaces to warm destination spaces like the, uh, like the auditorium. And again, here, staircases are carved out of the surface rather than being add-on elements, which would start to clutter up the scene. So, so this kind of formalism is all about making the essential spatial elements legible, easy to find oneself with others together in the relevant conditions, and have a lot of visual clues and choice. You can see the three peaks in a way. Uh, indicating the three parts and each having their own exterior zone and one central zone. So I want to show what this set of design principles are applicable also on all scales uh, in, the, in the realm of furniture, which is for us not only objects but also space making. And for me, all of architecture and design is about ordering social processes through <laughs> signaling and the communicative capacity of the built environment and furniture which indicate how we might arrange ourselves, how, how we can find the different atmospheres and characters. So this is what we, what we uh, show in our London office. We have a gallery there. We currently have Meteotopia. We invested also in new fabrication technologies. So we have here gathered not only our own work but also uh, ex-students, current students and young teachers using, in fact, mostly robotic fabrication. So robots <laughs> laying out rope, robots printing uh, freely in space, oh. bending a metal or assembling elements. And this is this world where you say this is a kind of um, experimental structures. They are still course more expensive than a kind of rotor molded plastic chair. They're less robust e either, but there's this variability and intricacy. So there's an exploratory uh, uh, trajectory here um, where we need a bit of interim tolerance, but we, are, we know that investing in these technologies makes a lot of sense. This is a uh, robot assembled um, uh, structures and chairs and we also have explanatory videos for all of these. This is a chair we've done here at our code uh, computation design group where we uh, use topology optimization. This is another structure where we did this. So we're doing a kind of surface form finding, shell-like surface form finding, and then overlay there a evolutionary topology optimized process of, of optimizing the reticulation and perforations to make it a very super light structure. And becomes very, very intricate, but 3D printing can handle any degree of intricacy. And therefore, this is, becomes an interesting technology, which is yet, of course, to scale up. But it's maybe a super, super light chair we're working on here. Um, it looks beautiful. It's very organic. It's, it's like an, an, a product of nature. And with 3D printing, we can start to micro-engineer material qualities that's what we're doing at the design research lab with, for instance, different. You can go from stiff to elastic and have a continuous material gradients. These are very new and interesting possibilities. So this one is a larger robotic printed, much more robust new chair I've designed. And this is a pavilion structure of some of the guys who AI built, who've been at DOL and now building a startup company. So in this show there is three or four startup companies presenting. So there's, this is the next stage as well where, where the research moves out of the university setting into a finance startup culture in London. 
another startup company about uh, robotic 3D printing, concrete. Uh, another one is actually, you see that robot arm, this is an um, ex-student, ex-staff, uh, founded a little robotics company. <laughs> and there's another company uh, about robotic hot wire cutting, so creating molds very fast or cutting stone. And so there's a series of firms and we also have, we used to work with a company called Robofold, using sheet material very intelligently. Like every startup, there's a risk, so Robofold had folded in the meantime. <laughs> but the technology is, 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 is available. We continue to work with these principles. So um, we've been um, also experimenting with amorphous landscapes of furnishings where we don't necessarily know in advance uh, what they mean, but there is something where we have an open-endedness and indeterminacy uh, in that parametricism spirit. So we're creating these interiors which have which which have a kind of fluidity and create spaces and characterize spaces, but these are open spaces, dynamic spaces, uh, which one might add and subtract elements to create different conditions. So this goes across all scales, all sorts of materials, all the way from car design to boat design to <coughs> furnishings to hotel rooms to, to handbags. And in my book, Permalism 2.0, I've also invited friends like Ross Lovegrove from the industrial design side of things. And uh, some of our car designs, furniture designs, um, chandeliers, lighting elements. So there's, there's, there's a lot. Um, also the way we integrate outdoor and landscape features and furnitures. And using materials, also traditional materials like timber. Um, a pavilion which we created together with the timber furniture, uh, different types of seats, uh, rehearsing the 18th century love seat and creating uh, also larger dining tables, etc. So this is not for to, to show myself off, but this is a <laughs> suit. So we've designed that seat which can take three people, five people, but I'm also in a fashion uh, dabbling in fashion design. Um, so this is a neoprene suit and I've done two of them. There's a very, very light material. It's perforated in various places. What's great about this, I, th I think that um, fashion should be also more sophisticated now. It should be super light, learned from the high-tech sport industry. You can run with this, you can play football with this, and you can still go uh, to an evening <coughs> Uh, outing. And for me this is important because I think um, this is not in contradiction with, uh, with the technological advances. Uh, we, all, uh, we as architects integrate all these engineering advances for the sake of co also communicating identities, communicating atmospheres, event conditions. So that for me all design is communication design. And um, that's why we also go with jewelry and I think we need, the society needs to differentiate personas just as it needs to differentiate places for different occasions and it's a kind of big sorting machine, the, the city. And when you look at all the different uh, repertoires of manufacturing which coming out now with 3D printing and robotics and various textures of um, uh, scooping uh, which is much more versatile now than um, just the nerve surface we used to model. This for me is a very, very rich repertoire of articulation in the architect's hands, a new palette, a new expressiveness which we cherish. Of course it is technologically super fit, super light, but it's also a palette of articulation and I, I would emphasize this when I'm talking about the social functionality of parametricism. And of course, it has to be super comfortable, um, uh, super light. <coughs> and sometimes I could be a bit extravagant. So these, these are the uh, shoes 
15 centimeter high. There's a 3D printed core, which makes it possible a cantilever shoe, but it's also at the same time, it's actually leather and rubber, super light, and you can run with these high heel shoes. I promise you. And my friend Ross Lovegrove, an electric car, and it's trying to be very, very light and elegant. So this is also a new lifestyle, a new sensibility which we need to create. And learning from nature and making... This is his shoes, this is Ross Lovegrove's shoes. I'm just going through quickly, this is also retail environments. I mean, it's universally applicable, this is jewelry. Uh, we're doing exhibition design as well and experimental installations. So we're moving, you know, there's still a lot of trying out spatial sensibilities. You can see this installation, which later on becomes maybe an image of a large atrium with bridging uh, to create a kind of Piranesi style space. And um, our building at the High Line. And the way some of the uh, this integration of exterior and interior, it's a split level, and we, are, we we make that not a rift, you make that a continuous flow across the split level. Some of the apartments have internal split levels, etc. And the way the balconies play and generate different conditions, and, um, and fabrication becomes very important that we get a handle on this, and. Um, we also achieve uh, beauty and elegance which can compete with the best historical examples, I would argue. We'll show that uh, later. Adapting into existing conditions is very important. This building touches two historical buildings. It also scoops around a tree and um, has different characters of space as a library space, a lobby space sectional uh, connections to be communicative, very open into the garden space, etc. And this house adapts to the condition of being in a forest and pulls the bedrooms up to the level of the tree canopies. So you're up there, suddenly viewing into the landscape and you pull down, the lower rooms are embedded in the forest. And again, uh, courtyard penthouse uh, with a rich material palette and homage also on to the uh, Chinese courtyard house in Beijing. Or the use of timber in the uh, Cambodia <coughs> documentation center. So it's also where we start seeing this doesn't have to be a kind of it could have more materials, it could have cultural sensitivities embedded, it has, it has just a much more rich variety of potentials of articulating ideas um, than one might have thought 10 years ago when we looked at uh, these kind of, let's say, glossy nerve surfaces only. There's much more to parametricism than that. And in the end, it's all about uh, inventing new forms of interactions, new ways of living, new ways of working together, uh, having mixed use uh, buildings, atria. This is the building we have completed in Chennai. It's a big IT center and I think it, um, it's a, a very, very large working hub. residential towers where, with, with one. We always would like to have one at least interior sensation where things come together and this is where we connect between apartments and hotels in a shared amenity zone in the, in the section of the tower. And uh, when it comes to towers, we're interested in expressing the structure. This is in Miami, so there's an exoskeleton uh, where you sense that the forces are different at the bottom from the middle and the top. There's more structure and as the structure becomes lighter we can also have less room division. So we have three apartments and two apartments and one apartment for floor. And uh, we can vary also the way the balconies are placed. And um, 
this is on site, or a tower for the Iraqi Central Bank where we are rejecting the kind of ubiquitous curtain wall glass tower and have something where structure becomes strong shading. And this also then signals the different directions the tower looks very different and becomes a kind of orienting landmarks, nearly closes down to the sun and opens up to the waterfront in the north and opens up um, again to, to make uh, navigation through the tower uh, an experience, an orienting experience. But also the way podium and tower are connected and the way the path uh, from the horizontal pass connects up with the vertical pass. These are the themes where you have uh, curvature as an aid to continuing a trajectory which, which has a degree of complexity through a project. And you don't get lost as, you, as, as for instance, sharp corners break the path. This is a strongly environmentally conceived project. It's an energy research center in Riyadh. It's a big field space based on hexagonal cells which become courtyards and rooms and uh, with a lot of shaded outdoor areas. You can see those peaks, these are the courtyards which scoop, capture wind and shade the sun. Um, university project in Miami. So we also like to create large ensembles and build the kind of urban fabrics. And uh, this is a big airport project in Beijing where we have use the, the, the roof as a navigation device. And again, these shell-like arching structures are efficient, but they also are space-making and potentially the ribbing becomes also an orienting device. And uh, again, the use of structure and pulling together at the ground level to make space for amenities in different residential towers, a new complex in, Beige, in, in China with a museum and an opera house and a multi-purpose hall. So the integration of built form and landscape form is very important. We want to have a continuity. So the three quite different buildings with different forms, a series of exterior spaces, but we'd like to forge a unified territory which rules of navigation and um, various surfaces indicating activities and um, also allowing for different pathways to in inject themselves into this. And always atria and vertical connections and the idea of helping orientation in three-dimensional orientation spaces, if you like. <coughs> Just a quick glimpse of something we proposed here for in, in Delhi, at the, in the Lichens Master Plan. This is our proposal for the History and War Museum. Um, and here we intuitively thought something which has it's a relatively closed form, it's a museum, but very, very open, colonnade style at the ground floor and has some, for me it has some kind of Indian flavor, I'm not sure if you agree with me. <laughs> um, and courtyards and, and, and um, the materiality could be a local stone potentially. And uh, there's also a certain degree of monumentality and formality, and kind of an axial approach. And, um, Just a kind of tectonic element to, to, to differentiate zones, courtyards, open colonnade zones with a lot of air flowing through potentially and then having a very large series of rooms on top. <coughs> okay, so um, <coughs> that was part one. <laughs> Um, so in terms of the magazine, or this book magazine, Pernas 2.0, I'm invited a series of protagonists uh, to contribute. But also in the introduction I showed that hermetism is happening, it's happening here in India, in, in, the, in the 
airport and also showing this article, uh, Shenzhen Airport, our Beijing Airport, large projects and also our big Beijing projects in all parts of town, showing that we can deliver that this is um, a style which has viability and should generalize. And this generalization means diversification and richness because the, the repertoire variation within this style is in itself much more varied and fertile than all the other styles put together. So if we leave the other styles behind and moving into here, we're actually entering a world of riches. It's not an impoverished condition. Um, so you can see how different this is in many ways, but it shares the fundamental abstract principles. And this is a very large part of uh, Beijing urbanism. Uh, this is five million square feet. We have another one with five million, another the third one with four and a half million in, Beijing, in, in Shanghai, etc. And I will, in, so I'm talking about um, social functionality in my articles, and I'm talking about this idea, this vision of a new urban order which is market driven but doesn't lead to the garbage spill condition we are facing now. is positing under the auspices of permatism a new form of complex variegated nature like order. An, an, a city which can be ordered without uh, uni unified master plan or central force but a bottom-up ecology of interventions coalescing into an order like nature. But I want to show that what I'm showing in the magazine is also key protagonists like Afi Mengus and if you look at his pavilions, experimental structures, each of them has a particular structural principle, a particular material principle and fabrication principle. So that's where the research goes and you can see a lot of them are shell forms but they're quite different in their character and articulation with different capacities. So there's an active bending, there's this, the, the hexagonal cells, uh, there's the carbon fiber weaving, and different uh, modular carbon fiber weave, weaving, and another robotic carbon fiber laying in, in, into a bubble, etc. So you get a very, very nice variety. Mark Fons was using kind of bottom-up <coughs> 2D into 3D computational processes delivering very, very complex organic structures and I think these are very important experiments and you, what I find fascinating is the diversity of, of expressiveness of communicative capacity which is being built up by these. And again, connecting it back in the magazine to people like Dieste and Fry Otto, as the world we should inhabit, could inhabit, and um, even back to Gaudi, and the geometric system he explored. And the, the kind of strange and, and compelling beauty which comes out of that. We've been experimenting with small scale structures, a super thin aluminum shell for the V&A. This is a kind of robofold shell I've talked about for the Biennale, very, very thin and, and particular, so we have this kind of curved origami principle of cutting, scoring, and bending elements with the robot. And the idea of using shells, but using structural software, for instance, the indication of primary stress lines, and then executing these as ribbing structures. Uh, as a form of optimization, which also again gives gives this articulation and character and identity to the elements, and also indicate where if you put an entrance or cut a hole in this, it will also be announced by the ribbing. So we recreated one of Candela's iconic churches, three high paths connected up, but we introduced asymmetry and we introduced the um, stress line reticulation. And then we execute it in layered steel tube with a very simple principle. And a recent project where we used kind of structural optimization to give uh, articulation to the, to the ceiling in this extension of Mises uh, Berlin National Gallery. 
or tensile structures has been a theme across different pavilions, scaling up to a small building and then scaling up uh, in a larger project. And then, by the way, all the way to the Olympic Stadium Tokyo 2020, where we had the combination of shell and tensile. So this is often the way we work. Uh, it takes a number of years to learn the principles, to explore the materiality, to get used to it. the particular engineering aspects, fabricators, and then build up the capacity to roll out. And um, that's why we have the research group for. But I also want to show this one. So we had a series of competitions and shell structures, experimental shell structures in concrete with the code team, also with students. And now we have this project, for instance, which has a very, very large, super high performance concrete shells and a whole grouping and collection of them for the RGS Presidential Palace. These are very, very large spent at times, and um, we worked with um, various engineers on optimizing those. And uh, the patterning again is based on the primary stress line so that we can give uh, perforations, and we, but it also it gives a sense of ornamental heightening. So um, I call this tectonic articulation where the, uh, the factura or the structural logics or fabrication based tessellations etc. are brought under an organic principle and they're becoming nearly automatically not quite, this form a kind of a, um, identity sponsoring ornament. I think that's very important. It's similar to the way it worked in the Gothic. And that's been a big inspiration. So we get these kind of um, structures. And then we have a whole variety of set of principles. So we can compare what we're doing to the Gothic. But in the Gothic, you had always, each church had one pattern repeated with even base, and we have a whole variety of shells and sizes and patterns, and we don't take 300 years, we take kind of three years. <laughs> so, so, but we're in the game of, um, and these are the different, each space has a different uh, way of translating. And, um, different conditions. Also the Gothic inspired cluster columns, uh, spawn the ribs funnel into, into columns, etc. Um, you get very, very festive and elegant, uh, beautiful spaces. But there is an underlying rationality driving these, and these are paraboloid arches. Uh, this becomes a kind of light and, and transparent uh, project, Tokyo. And then working with students based on the principles for Otto, for instance, for Google Campus. And these, these shells are no longer symmetrical. What we now have achieved is we can, through the software, we can, like for Otto used to do it, we can make very irregular footprints, so we can be adaptive to complex forms, uh, the rooms, and still mount shells on top and layer these, intersect these and get a much more variety and even with a colleague or collaborator like Philip Block he can have compression only stone shells nearly on any irregular footprint similar to what Fryota was doing and so these are different projects I was teaching at the Harvard to, to make uh, use different and quite different ways of developing surface active structures. And what is nice about these, th th these shells, they're much more articulating the room size, the relay hierarchy between rooms, their relationship whether they intersect or one is the rest on the other than just flat slabs. So there's something about the, the, the legibility of a cluster of spaces, which I like about uh, shells. There's kind of bubbles of the bubble diagram become literally trans translated and don't get obfuscated. This was about kind of nesting of catenaries within catenaries, for instance. So 
So um, the last chapter of this, uh, and, and that's for me is important when, when I say if you have a complex um, space like um, Google Campus, face the problem of orienting and navigating. And I think these, the parameters can help with this and allow that to be become uh, much more viable to bring literally thousands of people organized in different departments and sub-departments overlapping in interdisciplinary uh, project, etc. You can articulate overlap and relationships much better. So in, the underlying theme is, and that's my last chapter of the, of the talk, is the move from Fordism to post-Fordism. This is the new technologies we bring to bear in the built environment, but these new technologies imprinting themselves on all our relationships because we, our relationships become much more dynamized because we are now in a continuous research, development, marketing, financing, project uh, interaction process, networking 24-7 in the big cities. So we're moving back together in the big cities and you have that urban concentration happening whereas on the Fordism you had a kind of spreading out into the suburbs we are separating out different factories and parts of life in green fields neatly sorted to be beavering way in parallel because for 10 years, 20 years you would do exactly the same thing and you could have a lifelong career. Um, this is very, very different now but at the time you also had only five things all your life. You had this one little uh, you had this one, uh, one house, this one washing machine, this one TV channel, the same cornflakes for decades on your tape. <laughs> it was good and you had hot water, but now we have a much more richer life, a much more a dynamic life. Uh, and it demands of us that we reinvent ourselves, that we keep connecting with each other, and we can't hide away from each other. And that means the city is becoming much more intense. And so this was the era of Fordism, this was about spreading out and uh, delivering. This was the image of that city, separation, specialization, and then repetition in each part. So the business district, the residential district, the logistics and factory district as just separate zones. And then everybody, a nine to five commute between these, a strict separation between um, work life and uh, let's say, private and recreational life is very different now. And uh, the last big effort in mean, Brasilia is, is built on this principle of uh, the Fordist modernist city where the different parts are laid out and uh, you can commute between them, there's not much interaction, everything is kind of a, a simple mechanical machine. There's beauty in this, there's coherence and order of course and these could be centrally planned, these could be laid out. And, but this paradigm of our civilization was kind of superseded and these ways of working and living in the separate uh, this was becoming to be questioned and there was a move back into the city, back into uh, a kind of mixed use texture where where we all come together. So so we moving a bit from this paradigm of simplicity, repetition, clarity of order, which now couldn't represent our society anymore because we are very very different. We have uh, uh, different life trajectories, different lifestyles. There's a diversity now happening, and this image of a Moscow city is much more the image of the contemporary. It's been called the postmodern condition, and uh, but postmodern architecture wasn't the answer. So we have these kind of things happening, and nobody has planned that and could have planned that. Although we have lots of planners laboring, <laughs> pretending that they're planning, but nobody wanted that, could anticipate this. So so I'm saying um, planners don't show any order as a result of their work, but what they maybe do is they, in a sense, prevent a spontaneous order which I would expect the market to deliver. And they also prevent, in a way, the, um, uh, the true dynamism which is possible because there is a huge housing crisis in London, 
So there's, although a lot of things happening, it's not happening enough, it's happening in the wrong places. And what is built is mostly the wrong product. So I've been questioning the whole planning process. First of all, because we don't get the order which we have promised. Um, but we get a lot of disruption of the spontaneous market order. And we get a kind of an incredible slowdown in development of the city. And we're getting, as I said, uh, yeah, a lot of interference in the entrepreneurial freedom and in the market process would, would, should be able to discover the, the spatial and institutional synergies what the sites require. So we at the moment we have actually land use plans and restrictions, density restrictions, unit size restrictions, etc., which, which uh, for no good purpose. So, so I believe that we're living in this new condition, and we've been living in this condition for a while. And um, this is a kind of mixture of modernism going kind of post Fordist, and we have these kind of agglomerations everywhere, and it's kind of menacing. It's 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 it's. You don't even know where these are. They could be anywhere. This could be Asia. This could be Latin America. This could be India. And everywhere we have we have this kind of visual chaos. There are still some kind of iconic buildings which might give you a sense of the landmark in this endless spill. But they are kind of, and we are participating in this as well. They sometimes mark a place, but this is only a small it's a drop in the ocean, and you actually can't generalize this. Yes, this is easy. You can make a landmark like we're doing in Marseille or here in Miami, perhaps. But very soon, this gets polluted, and they all cancel each other out in this kind of strange agglomeration. And uh, no matter what you, an in, in individual agglomeration of icons can't deliver. So we need kind of figures, but they kind of self-cancelling, and we get this kind of condition. And the condition here is what the problem is. You, there is a kind of discoordination, the multiple styles, multiple <coughs> materials and colors, and they remain discoordinate because the spirit, the ethos of our current discipline is that everybody can do their own as they please, and you have this kind of self cancelling visual chaos. Now what is fascinating is the density, and I subscribe to this. I even would think that these towers should start to have connections on multiple levels and become a kind of symbiotic uh, three-dimensional urbanism. I, but, but it is incredibly disorienting because it's totally unpredictable what's next to what, what's coming. And you don't know if these are residential or office or mixed use or retail. It, nothing is speaking, nothing is telling. It's actually communicating nothing and that is, that is my problem. And uh, here it literally looks like a garbage spill. And the thing is that this looks like this everywhere around the world. And I'm saying for the last 30 years, there's not a single urban district <coughs> of a certain size in the world which has any beauty or order, a sense of order and identity at all. So we have, this is totally not happening. And everywhere you get the attempt to create identity, you invite these architects, and the net result is always spill. And I challenge you, I mean, the last beautiful urban setting, maybe it was Brasilia or maybe it was a Miami Art Deco district where you had modernism, you had stylistic coherence and, and the plan, but we can't go back to that. We can't go back to the central plan, but what we can do, we can have the kind of stylistic coherence of parametricism with that new versatility, but a set of principles which I think could forge. Um, the bottom of urban order. So when you look at these spills, you know this is London only because of the River Thames are certain figures inscribed. So it's only the the natural systems, rivers and mountains, which give any form of structure, order, rhythm and identity to to an urban metropolis. So It's, it's, it's the rivers, and um, you, you, you can, the river could also used to be much more like this, so it's kind of branching out and ramifying these kind of laws and logic. You get a lot of variety, differentiation, and texturing, 
but under a set of principles you could follow, where it is ramifying and the interaction between river and topography is, is principled and rule-based. And paramatic design is all about rule-based design. So we are looking at generating a city texture not by a random pollution with buildings, uh, willful and discoordinated, but through a set of rule system, and that's what we call paramatic urbanism. We can start doing this, we can differentiate not a hundred similar blocks, we can kind of have um, a pulsating of densities, uh, which would be delivered if you could, for instance, land value maps, you sometimes see those, they have these kind of textures and profiles, so if you let the market come through, then you actually have a much more rhythmic and proper navigable image, just on that basis already. And I just show this sometimes when you see that you, but then as architects we can also add a formalism, the compositional stance where we worry about the overall sense of order in, and the figure, figurative, uh, uh, phenomenological uh, conspicuity of, of a design and not just about the pragmatic. And that compositional stance is not only about beauty, which but it's about orientation. So here is, for instance, a park and ride scheme with two car parks on opposite side of a street, plus a bus station and a train station. And if I mention this program, and you imagine this kind of disfigured suburban landscape, you could have imagined that this design totally disappears and becomes invisible and unfindable. But what, so our emphasis here to use curvature, use the graphics of tarmac and concrete, the, of the uh, car lines and affiliate them formally to the lamp posts and let the lamp posts grow in size as you come closer to the um, train and bus station and then these lines become columns and the and the lights in the roof become uh, cuts so you have a total coherence of an overall formal system across different pragmatic elements and materials and the concrete ties back, of course, with that big sweep across the road, tying the two sides together. So that's what I call a compositional articulatory um, design strategy. And uh, this also works at night. And then you see here that the, the train makes a cut, the bus makes a cut, that swings across the car park and ties the, ties the car parks together. So that's, that's something with the way we would have composition becoming high performance delivery. So we have to talk about the instrumentality of appearances and not be shy about making form and formal work a problem. But this is also part of a solution, of course. We're working on formal articulation as a problem. So that is for me very important and a subtext, the universal subtext to my work in parameticism. So, so this is, for instance, a skyline and variation of textures. You have these gradients which would naturally form if you let the market work. And from cul-de-sac to grid-like, the build-up of the density and complexity. And for me, this is a vision. For me, is the city should work like a natural environment. A complex variegated order where different subsystems, kind of the mountains, the rivers, the fauna, the flora, relative to the sun orientations, is all a series of algorithms layering on top of each other, a series of rule-based systems integrating and adapting to each other. That's the way we should lay out the city. And then these environments are eminently predictable and navigable because creatures which are much dumber like us, for instance birds of prey, find their prey in these systems because one thing predicts another. Everything laid out by rule becomes an inference, a retrieval system. So these are cities we imagine would be constituted and constructed by a series of algorithms and rules, which would play out the way you lay a set of roads across the topography is very similar to the way the water would flow, flow across the surfaces. And then you kind of the buildings swarm in like different plants would settle according to varying uh, conditions gradually shifting from one condition to another and multiple subspecies would layer on top of each other and these, would, these are the kind of things where then a kind of vertical 
peaking represents a, a plan like compression. And we can also, as you can see here, we can, on the left you see the way these textures pick up and affiliate to existing contexts. So there's a kind of integration of existing textures into a new texture. And then there's also the possibility to make facade articulation and the architecture do urban work and be coherent and relational like the different plants at the different conditions have to do with where they're located on the north or south edge of the of the mountain close to the water away from the water that will these kind of relationships would also come through positional differentiation in the buildings so i'm showing a matching these kind of uh, uh, visions and vistas and the building here is of course an island of articulation in in, in a big spill on Seoul and it's trying to squeeze itself into this tr strangely formed site and it's mediating between park and building and sunken gardens and underground connections and various passages through and over the building and into the building for multiple sites. So it's something very, very complex, but at the same time, it's very kind of easy and natural to navigate and um, with bridges pushing through and piercing through. It becomes a kind of quasi landscape uh, where we also suppress a lot of details, a lot of windows which are behind this perforated metal, so we're focusing the eye on key cuts and key passages and a series of spaces rather than having a kind of clutter of windows and, and other things. And this becomes also lighting, uh, embedded hidden lighting, uh, ground lighting, etc. etc. And it becomes very elegant and easy to do a lot of complex things, a lot of audiences, three or four permanent museums, multiple galleries uh, coming together in this in this play. And this was had eight million visitors in the first year uh, as an exhibition center, uh, only surpassed, surpassed by the Louvre in that year. So there are very, very large events happened there as well, like pop concerts. And so it's very versatile. It's also an open texture for appropriation. So it's a very like a stimulating um, uh, in urban and in, uh, occupational invention because it has an abstractness initially where not everything is pre-typologized and also very important that we open up into abstract configurations which are more stimulating than, uh, than uh, only working with known types of spaces. And this is also the way we work with, with, with podium tower conditions, they're more integral um, large clusters of towers, we're not afraid of scale and monumentality, if you like, because the sides are different, the north and south side are different, there are different <coughs> types of towers, uh, there's integration of retail hotels and, and, and office buildings, and it's not boring, it's a kind of landscape and valley of, of, of uh, unfolding offerings. This was an experiment in multiple students, so 12 students working together, but each have their own building, uh, working under parametrism with, if you look close, uh, there are principles at play, uh, different forms of shells and tensile structures, um, space frames and various other types, but they are working off each other, with each other, nestling to each other with an ethos of fitting together, of being resonancing with each other, of being not stubbornly isolated, but being adaptive to each other. And parametrism allows us the kind of mutual adaptation of different projects which know of each other or come layer on top of each other in sequence. They could form a unity, a kind of continuously evolving, never complete, but always coherent ensemble of interventions because these buildings have to do with each other. There are different cultural interventions. And, and if an entrepreneur is free to place, take a site, and then he would want to place something on the site which had a lot to do with all the other things already on the site. If he has that freedom to generate these synergies, 
he would do so and then would want us to articulate what it has to do with all the others. So it connects up, because that's the reason why he's building that in the first place. So, so that would be a kind of my answer to the garbage spill condition at the moment where there's restrictions, you can never do the right thing because some bureaucrat had marked the space for something else. Then they're demanding certain setbacks and shapes and, and, and forms, they're demanding certain materials even in, in England. So you don't allow yourself to be expressive, to be affiliative, to be resonating, to be particular and articulate. Uh, so we, that's why we end up with this kind of strange paradox of over-subscribed uh, uh, restrictions which are meant to generate order, but they create both programmatic and visual disorder, uh, which nobody likes. Everybody hates the identity to this. We all suffer from that sense of lack of identity. And what I'm talking about is like what here you, what you see here, there's a kind of bottom-up emergence of unique identities because these buildings are uniquely related to each other. Uh, there's a past-dependent build-up of complexity and uh, variety, but a new urban identity which has to do with the coast and which has to do with the particular urban textures you find, with the climate, uh, with the various uh, programs. And I think that each part of a city and each city as a whole will become unique and uniquely recognizable, yet uh, uh, following, like the different valleys and floras and faunas around the world are unique and different. There's a, you can sense a place. Uh, in, in, in nature. So this, these are all scripted urbanisms, rule-based. And this is only when one or two or three students kind of come in and, 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 and uh, these are still too homogenous, but I'm thinking the city would be not three or, three or four architects and authors, the city will be hundreds of authors, hundreds of species. So you will get that diversity, but I think also we all share the ethos and global best practice sensibility of, of a parametricism, like in 1960, every architect self-respecting their frontier of their discipline, uh, if we regain that sense of purpose and um, self-respect, I would argue, rather than being kind of self-indulgent and saying, well, I have nothing to do with this, I know what I want, that's a kind of indefensible stance, I would argue, at the moment. Uh, then we would actually be able to deliver a city which must be a collective project, but it must be a collective project born out of responsible use of freedoms, the entrepreneur's freedom, the developer's freedom, as well as the architect's freedom, but this freedom exercised in a, in a discursive environment where we also criticize each other and take each other to task and weed out excesses and self-indulgences in a, in, a, in, a, in a discursive process, and I think that's what we can do because in an advanced society, every developer would have to hire an architect. Somebody would come through our discourse, would have been taught by us and share references, share ethos, and, 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 and share kind of uh, a, 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 the, being exposed to kind of collective criticism. I think that could deliver, should deliver, might deliver. And so these are just some glimpses of projects where these are just fragments of something which I envisage, which has that new level of complexity, the three-dimensional <coughs> layeredness, intensity, and maybe is still more monotonous than we would like to see it. Uh, but we are still at the beginning of this style. So, but these are, I think, glimpses at uh, urban potentials uh, where it's fun to move, there's stimulation, there's lots of events, lots of uh, there's hundreds of startup companies. We have our own office in this complex as well, by the way. A lot of restaurants, a lot of places, a lot of shops to go to, and uh, a lot of events happening. And this, con this is still on the, in the outside only, and then we're moving up to the inside. This continues in, in, in the interiors with these kind of uh, spaces and always using daylight and using vistas and sectional connections to, to uh, make this viable. And sometimes very, very large events uh, are made possible. So this is about structuring social process in an efficient way where you know where you are, where you not get frustrated by run, r running down corridors and continuously missing the events, uh, not seeing the friends, not participating in the urban 
stimulation. That's what a lot of the contemporary architecture is doing to us, and this is kind of giving, getting a glimpse. So th these kind of spaces are of, of interest to us, and I, I want to show that uh, we want to make towers hollow, we want to use step out of course into panoramic elevators so that on the way up we can already see what's going on, where we might go the next time, or what we're going to pick up on the way out. And they're kind of dramatic, they're stimulating, they're, they're, they're transparent, always connecting back to the urban as well. So these are uh, atrium conditions we, we love. Uh, atriums which connect on one floor, where usually the core separates all the parts of the floor, connects across the floor and connects still back into the urban fabric, I would believe, because um, and this is something we're now executing, this is on site in Beijing. Um, that big atrium tower with connections to the outside. But more importantly, we, 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 we want to think even larger. This is a, something I showed earlier. So this is literally hundreds and thousands of events and people being inter-aware and, and inter-visually connected and then literally connected across by, by these kind of bridges. and terracing in each other's view. So this would be a vision of an urbanism. Towers should start to look like this rather than being a kind of closed box with a core in which you disappear, a corridor in which you disappear, and a cell you disappear where you have thousands of people who never see each other, like not aware of each other. And um, that's also a situation when you, you always go to your same desk on the 17th floor and do your stamp your papers, that's not the world we live in anymore. We have designed recently, we're designing office buildings where you have self-directed work, people are roaming freely, they don't have desks, we have 500 people, but we have only 300 or 400 places which you can self-select as you build your interactions. Lots of roaming settings, so-called activity or deterioratized office space. That's the kind of world which, which the network society requires. And that needs to have these self-organizing clusters in view so you can work along and you're not kind of pre-sorted on a schedule but you're kind of self continuously self-sorting in environment. We won this competition in, in Wuhan, it's a conglomerate where we're trying a similar idea uh, where multiple companies which belong to one conglomerate are housed in this, in this building and should be uh, interacting with each other, a lot of amenity spaces on the ground floor. And, and then a lot of action and activity all the way up and through the tower. Um, I think also very stimulating, very transparent. And um, um, you know, more important facilities and functions which should be seen by many and then pulled out into these bridges or onto the ground floor. And we're doing another one in uh, in Moscow, it's a spare bank with 6,000 employees working on continuously developing the, the bank algorithm. So, you know, banking companies are now, or banks are now more, largely tech companies. Tech uh, bureau landschaft across multiple levels. And what I'm talking about, and I'm just giving you a hint, that when we have thousands of people ordered in different departments, teams, and, and processes, we need to start modeling not only the furniture, we need to actually model the actions and interactions, and that becomes parametric simulations of the life processes because they're no longer trivial. There's no longer five categories of rooms where we locked in for 10 years. That's, a, that's kind of fluid, dynamic, parametrically variable event scenarios pulsating through the building, and then we need to dis decide how many entrances and access, degrees of porosity, how we distribute meeting spots, uh, coffee zones, networking spaces, uh, auditoria, all that matters a lot with respect to the interaction potential, the encounter frequency might engender, and these are the key success criteria, so now I'm talking about agent-based parametric semiology on uh, life process modeling as a social functionality parametrics, which I think for me is the next stage where I have a research grant and a research group which I'm building, where all the technolog technological uh, systems we've been working on come in to make this happen, to translate this, to make it real, to articulate the various zones and instruct and inform the actors and users which 
in, the, in something which I call the semiological project because all these different expressive textures and spaces and forms indicate which department, which scenario, what kind of interaction situation <clears throat> and who are the players we, we might en en encounter in which zone. That's the kind of vision uh, which, which I, am, I am working on at the moment. So uh, with this outlook I want to open up the discussion with you guys. Thank you. talking about a lot of things in DA and he has summed up this all the first three semesters in 60 minutes. So, so thank you for that, thank you for that. Here's a deal that after this we just do our thesis and we're done doing DA. Joking? Jokes apart? Can we have questions please? Hello, I'm Arkhidek Ravi Gadre. Uh, how this uh, initial uh, projects uh, and her style was uh, termed as suprematism. Suprematism. Uh, yeah, she was inspired by suprematism, but yes. it was then called deconstruction. And now you are uh, now you are at least to parametrism. So can you differentiate or what are the similarities? Well, actually, is? it's important. Uh, suprematism was one of the artistic styles of the Russian avant-garde. And it is important to note that modernism was in large way dependent on abstract art of the early 20th century. So if you look at the style, Mondrian into Don Wurstburg and Rietveld, to have a new kind of system of orthogonal lines which move without <coughs> symmetry of proportion and dissect space with more degrees of freedom, that was very important. And suprematism at the time had additional degrees of freedom because there was also shifting of angles as well as overlap conditions, layering conditions and these weren't extrapolated in, into the modernist. So the modernist era became orthogonally based, it became based on asymmetry and dynamic equilibrium composition but it wasn't picking up the hints of Emalevich, Elisitsky which had envisaged more complexity they also had at the time already curvature in there and they had gradient in there. So, so the way I would look at it, that at the beginning of the century through abstract art and, and you have new formal repertoires and only a part of them was taken up by modernism and translated into urbanism and architecture. And when modernism came into crisis in the 70s, uh, these kind of rigidities of an orthogonal system, a system of repetition, <coughs> maybe more degrees of freedom than a traditional axial-based, symmetry-proportion-based system, it had still lacking the degrees of freedom for the new complexity of a layered, densifying city. And at that point, there were different ways of engaging with this. The postmodernists wanted a kind of collage city. Deconstructivists were inspired by suprematism and had intersection of angles, layering, so that was in Zaha's term, after she's been working for 10 years, and some other protagonists like Frank Gehry, Liebeskind, and Schumi, and Eisenman, and Ram Kolas, that was called deconstructivism. So when I was a student in the 80s, I was becoming aware of her work and these protagonists' work, which I thought was the frontier of our discipline, because they were able to generate new levels of complexity under the heading of deconstructivism. Uh, which was inspired by suprematism and constructivism, if you like. So, so that's the lineage there. And I think since then, out of deconstructivism evolved parametricism. And I think the great advantage of parametricism is that if you go with this kind of Mikado-style layering and intersecting of forms, um, <clears throat> and you're trying to build up the complexity, you very quickly end up in visual chaos and illegibility. And that doesn't allowed to have a kind of sweeping global order. It just means a kind of fragmentation. It was certainly superior, I would argue, and more congenial to the contemporary condition than modernism was. It was also superior to post-modernism, which was just going back to his play the game of collage with historical motifs. So it was better to, to play that game of collage with more abstract potentials. But what was lacking was um, a new sense of order. 
this was nearly a random throwing together of complexities which became complicated, illegible. So we had to move out, and Zaha intuitively moved beyond that by using curvature, but not arcs, but a very pulsating, rhythmic, adaptive curvature, but which could hold the complex trajectory much better than a series of angles where you get lost very, very quickly. It could also have, she had this idea of swarms and gradients, gradient transformation, instead of a kind of abrupt changes and shift. So there were intuitive moves she made I think which, to, in order to deliver new projects which are both complex and legible, out of that developed parametricism when we started to also start to use the computational tools which were available and be much more systematic in the use of uh, what they now call, let's say, rule-based scripted differentiations rather than kind of um, random differentiations or seemingly random, which was deconstructed. So there's a strong shift in the um, in that avant-garde trajectory. So the way I look at it back, parametrism then was very, very stable. We are now in the nearly 25 years in, whereas deconstructism was only a decade. Postmodernism was maybe only 10, 15 years. So I call these transitional styles, which were superseded by parametrism. I don't think parametrism is transitional, because I think we can go with this it's for, for, for a long time. We actually have to deliver a new and built environment in this style. There's nothing else cut around the corner the way I see it. Uh, so, so um, or let's say that's a challenge to you guys. Is there something around the corner? Uh, I think it's actually the, the, the answer of the discipline to our era very much the way modernism was the answer to architecture's answer to the previous era. And the way, for instance, uh, Art Nouveau or Expressionism of the early, of the late teens and early twenties was superseded and taken off, uh, was, was, was transitional and superseded by modernism, I think deconstructed and postmodernism, in a sense, transitional styles, which delivered something. They delivered the desire of complexity, <coughs> they delivered, for instance, interpenetration of domains uh, through deconstructivism, but they were superseded and limited. So that's my challenge and my explanation why Zaha's work transformed, because it was also something where she allowed herself to be embedded in a collective search and not being a kind of solitary figure. We were very much part of a movement, and still are, um, rather than being kind of isolated figures who insist on their own individual uh, uh, style. I think that's a fallacy, styles, styles are collective convergences of epochal significance and uh, we, sh there's, we have no, uh, we have of course idiosyncrasies and you might recognize this or that as a Zahadid um, uh, design, but that for me is a limitation. It's an inevitable limitation because everybody has only a kind of uh, limited repertoire and we, we must, nearly by necessity, repeat ourselves a little bit in terms of our solutions, so we become recognizable. But that's not something we're proud of. It's something we 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 we, we accept as an inevitable limitation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, yeah. if you may. Your office, through its practice, has always pushed the limits and boundaries of what is what is physically buildable and socially acceptable. So, how important it is to shape the consensus about architecture in public? I think it's interesting and important, uh, but I think it's also, uh, you, could, you could shine through examples and compel through example, and that's why it's very important for me, and I have mentioned that, that architecture is kind of depoliticized. Um, you know, that's also why I said the planners should kind of withdraw a little bit, they can't actually deliver. And they're, they're a bit in the way of what makes possible, you have to trust individual investors with their own risk-taking and the profit and loss system of acceptance to, to filter this out and we can't all hold, hold hand before somebody is making an experiment. So we need to give each other much more freedom and then there will be some failures but they will be quickly corrected and there will be some which succeed despite prejudices against us. So that's the condition, for instance, we had with this Dongdaemon Design Center, which had 8 million visitors, the most popular destination in the world, 
next to the Louvre in its first year of existence. It's very, very well accepted now and, and becomes a kind of proud icon of Seoul, which is on their stamps, on their maps, was viciously attacked by every architect and journalist mm -hmm. and was meant to be nothing to do with the city, it is so really alien, and was, it was nothing to do with unexpected. So it was great that the, the mayor had the robustness uh, to do it, and, and a private entrepreneur should have had also the right to do this, and in the end you convince everybody. And I think that's very important. So we need to, in a sense, that this project survived, survived is a miracle, but we shouldn't get all wound up. If somebody has the right and acquired a site and is hiring an architect, it's not anybody else's business in my argument. <laughs> what he's doing with this, if there's some very, very general basic rules about rights of right and you're infringing, uh, because it's crazy, because if we have to hold hands and convince each other about everything we kind of allow to happen, then very little will happen. Or you have very, very repetition of awful stereotypes. Uh, as, and, and I think that's why I'm pleading for entrepreneurial freedom, hand in hand with architectural freedom. But of this, we, 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 we are criticizing each other, of course, in a, in a discourse as well. But this is, discourse of criticism isn't stopping. This is cajoling, convincing, inspiring inspiring self-criticism. That's the difference. For me, what is the problem with the politicization? We can have also political discourse as long as it doesn't mean that there's a kind of lawn, uh, uh, line drawn. So criticism is okay as long as you don't have the stoppage. So we can't have designed a city by committee and voting everything <laughs> on each project or let the elected officials do this on our behalf. That's what I find very, very problematic. And that's why, why I've come out against this, because I feel also that we're suffering from this. Not only that this, we'd be getting the wrong city, we're actually don't getting much city built at all. And this is the same thing happens not only with, 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 um, with urban development, it happens with many other things, with the introduction of technologies, with, with experimentation, with different ways of employment. I think all of Europe is stagnating on many levels, so, so I've come to believe that that the consensus uh, it is, mustn't be a condition to start. We have to have the conviction that what we're delivering is, has, has, has um, validity and we will be applauded after the fact. And you have to have a thick skin and, and a, a bit of self-belief. And of course there will be mistakes made, but at least if only 20% of those passionate, convinced people come up with, through with something new that's very much worthwhile. And the other 80, okay, they they get bloody noses, but let them <laughs> let them make that experience. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, taking the architect's freedom in design, uh, building become un unaffordable. Like become what? Unaffordable. Sometimes Zahadi is also building become unaffordable. Like no. Taizung, Taizung uh, Museum. If, if it's unaffordable, then it won't happen. And then Tokyo, and Tokyo Olympic Tokyo also was, uh, is not unaffordable. Tokyo was political. So to here political, I, okay. Tokyo was, well, you know, politicized. And that's why they bloodied their nose, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and our project was, I mean, I think they, what they're building now is less affordable than ours, by the way. But no, affordability is, of course, built into the process. And if an entrepreneur, thinks that he wants to work with this architect to create this kind of place which has that degree of attractiveness that it pays, uh, then this is self-justifying. So, so, and of course, if we do things which are unaffordable, then we won't do them. And we also had to learn that, that we have to be operating in economic conditions, and we do. Uh, all of our buildings are built, that means all of our buildings are generated value, and so far our clients have been doing extremely well. There hasn't been regretfulness about this. They've been commercially actually incredibly successful. <laughs> so, so even though because you pay more, but the value you generate is maybe a multiple of that. Uh, exactly, that's the value added. Any more questions, please? Thanks. So you would have otherwise wasted the site with something cheaper <laughs> and with a much reduced value. <laughs> uh, hi, in your experience, oh, 
what uh, do you think is the um, how does the Indian market react to digital architecture right now? In I don't know yet. I'm just, f just finding out. But you 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 are already you already built something in China. Well, we will. I mean, it's, it's actually what I've noticed that we. It's in, uh, there's a movie, it's, it's used as for movie scenes. <laughs> it's a bo Bollywood set, it became a, inadvertently a Bollywood set. <laughs> I would like to kind of reply to that. Uh, India, when it comes to its reaction of digital architecture, is ignorant. And we have to blame our fraternity for that. We are making a difference, not just in this academic year, but we travel elsewhere, take workshops and make people acknowledge that this medium is there whether you choose to ride the wave or not is your issue but let me tell you the way this hand in hand with architectural freedom but of this we, 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 we are criticizing each other of course in a, in a discourse as well but this is discourse of criticism isn't stopping this is cajoling convincing inspiring inspiring self-criticism that's the difference for me what is the problem with the politicization? We can have also political discourse as long as it doesn't mean that there's a kind of lawn, uh, 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 line drawn. So criticism is okay as long as you don't have the stoppage. So we can't have designed a city by committee and voting everything <laughs> on each project or let the elected officials do this on our behalf. That's what I find very, very problematic. And that's why, why I've come out against this because I feel also that we're suffering from this not only that this, we'd be getting the wrong city, we actually don't getting much city built at all. And this is the same thing happens not only with, 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 um, with urban development, it happens with many other things, with the introduction of technologies, with, with the experimentation with different ways of employment. I think all of Europe is stagnating on many levels, so, so I've come to believe that, that the consensus uh, it is, mustn't be a condition to start. We have to have the conviction that what we're delivering is, has, has, has um, validity and we will be applauded after the fact. And you have to have a thick skin and, and a, a bit of self-belief. And of course there will be mistakes made, but at least if only 20% of those passionate, convinced people come up with, through with something new, that's very much worthwhile. And the other 80, okay, they get bloody noses, but let them, <laughs> let them make that experience. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, taking the architect's freedom in design, uh, building become un unaffordable. Like become what? Unaffordable. Sometimes Zahad is also building become unaffordable. Like no. Taizung, Taizung uh, Museum. If, if it's unaffordable, then it won't happen. And then Tokyo, um, Tokyo Olympic Tokyo also was, is uh, not... Um, Tokyo was political. So to yeah, political, okay. Tokyo was, well, you know, politicized. And that's why they bloodied their nose, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and our project was... I mean, I think they, what they're building now is less affordable than ours, by the way. But no, affordability is, of course, built into the process. And if an entrepreneur thinks that he wants to work with this architect to create this kind of place, which has that degree of attractiveness that it pays, uh, then this is self-justifying. So, so, and of course, if we do things which are unaffordable, then we won't do them. And we also had to learn that, that we have to be operate in economic conditions, and we do. Uh, all of our buildings are built. That means all of our buildings are generated value, and so far our clients have been doing extremely well. There hasn't been regretfulness about this. They've been commercially actually incredibly successful. So, so even though because you pay more, but the value generate is maybe a multiple of that. Uh, exactly, that's the value added. Any more questions, please? Thanks. So you would have otherwise wasted the site with something cheaper and with a much reduced value. <laughs> In your experience, uh, what uh, do you think is the, um, how does the Indian market react to digital architecture right now? Yeah, I, I don't know yet, I'm just, f just finding out. But you, you, you're al you already built something in China. Well, we built, I mean, it's, it's actually, what I've noticed that we, it's in, uh, there's a movie, it's, it's used as for movie scenes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Bollywood set, it became a, 
inadvertently a Bollywood set. I would like to kind of reply to that. Uh, India, when it comes to its reaction of digital architecture, is ignorant. And we have to blame our fraternity for that. We are making a difference, not just in this academic year, but we travel elsewhere, take workshops, and make people acknowledge that this medium is there. Whether you choose to ride the wave or not is your issue. But let me tell you the way this, you either take the wave, ride the wave, or you miss the bus like a dodo, and then repent. The most important question would be, how do we dovetail it with our sensibilities? Which I think Patrick has covered beautifully in his presentation. Any more questions, please? And I was keen to understand that in the projects that you do in Asia, how do you control design fidelity? Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, when new technologies are bought, brought to emerging markets, design dilution is uh, commonly seen. So how do you, as the principal architect, ensure design fidelity? I mean, that's a very important question, and sometimes we maybe overplayed, we've been over ambitious, so we have to work triply hard to, to, to maintain control. So we do that by having offices in, the, in Beijing and in, in Hong Kong, and vet contractors to work with contractors. We're doing full BIM, BIM models, uh, all the elements to, 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 to gain precision. We go and vet various contractors to see their capacity work very hard as developers to not choose always the cheapest. I mean, it's a tough, it's, it's difficult, and you're quite right. It's very important because these things de de uh, demand a certain degree of precision in the execution, otherwise they become kind of distracting and lose their um, beauty and expressive power. So that's very, very important, and one has to sometimes calibrate the ambition with respect to local contractors and availability of, of um, subcontractors and so on, we, we also do that. And of course, one has to one generates the, the also the intuition about what's the right level of ambition relative to a budget, for instance. Uh, so it is a ch it's been a challenge, and there's been some glitches, I have to admit that. And then we can have to go back and repair and, and, and make good. And, and uh, so, so there's definitely a challenge there. But again, this is a... This is a, a, a new paradigm, a new set of methodologies and ambitions. We are still in the early days, early years. So I think there's a lot to mature, and also the industry will, has to mature quite a bit more uh, before this becomes um, much more taken for granted that these things can be executed um, in different arenas. And of course, there's, it's, it's not going to be universally spreading. It will be first in primary sites with primary institutions that need and aspire to a higher level of complexity in their, in their institutional processes and want to make that, make that openness uh, viable. Uh, so we will, we will have first the high value um, uh, players, but down the line I think this is equally applicable also <laughs> even to mass housing social housing, if you like, or let's say uh, economical housing, because again there you would also want to have variety in the product. Not everybody is exactly the same. You shouldn't have a one-fit-all if it becomes economically to have a whole range of sizes and diagrams and relationships. You can tailor much more, and in the end you get much more value out of the product if you can have that variety methodologically delivered, technologically delivered, that would be a more economical, a more successful product. This is universally applicable in principle, uh, but we will, we will hone our skills and we will bring up the industry on the high value projects first, but certainly there are the ec economies in the, in the generalization downstream. So this is not something which sometimes accuse that this is for the elites, this is only for the 1%. At the moment, yes, it's like the mobile phone was first for the 1% and now it's for the 99%. And uh, uh, so, so that will, will be the trajectory. And I have to claim, I make a claim for universal applicability of these principles within the contemporary condition uh, of our civilization. Um, I have a related question. Uh, yeah. You, say, for example, the Azerbaijan project that yeah. you showed. Now, for public projects where there is time pressure, there is budget pressure, what is the kind of time you spend on mock-ups and prototyping? 
yes, we have a number of mock-ups and and and, um, and these are still manifesto projects of sorts, right? But we have built up relationship with subcontractors on this particular project, which we now use on other projects. So, so, so that the next time round we can only we have less prototypes, we have less um, searching time. So, so as I said, this is something which will universalize, and 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 as uh, contractors will invest in robotics, will invest in CNC control processes, in logistics operations, if they if, as they will skill up. Uh, then the universality of this becomes much more viable. So yes, at the moment that there is a cost surcharge on these kind of projects, but you have a value enhancement in the product. But as I said earlier, the economics even of delivery on the cost side, these projects should, in a final analysis, be cheaper. Because for instance, if you if you if you have a steel beam and you optimize its profile to the moment uh, profile and then vary that beam as span shifts you vary the column as you go up to, to, the, to, to the tower you have an enormous saving on tonnage and we've already done this in our Wolfsburg space frame sometimes you even needed to have that span possible at all that you lighten out the members where you can as much as possible you save tonnage you save um, um, an expand span at the same time, and um, you will have less embodied energy. You have lost material cost because that once it's all geared up, the cost which is in the information, or whether the laser cutter cuts 100 equal beams or 100 different beams, there is very very little cost differential. So my prediction is that these buildings will be more cost effective plus more value enhancing, so they will be absolutely compelling. Um, um, proposition. And of course, what, 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 what will happen, I think also that the, the we're living in an information society, so, so the, the, the aspect of value which is due to design, which always will always maintain a research and development element, will become larger. So in, in India, it's, you're still behind. I mean, in London, you have, for, for sophisticated building, 10% of the values in the design, in all the consultancies. Here, it's maybe 2%. So, so that will increase. And why shouldn't it? The overall cost goes down. The informational intelligence part, we're going to send substituting intelligence for, for raw material labor. And even if you go to the contractors themselves, they have mostly now white collar technicians, engineers, and so on. So that element will increase, but the overall, so you will maybe more, make more mock-ups, but the overall building will be much cheaper. I would like to know as to how important is it for an institute uh, to take up research and innovation in architecture? Uh, well, an institute is nearly by definition, uh, it's a raison d'etre, as <laughs> research and development and innovation. That's what we're here for. I mean, I think the university is, is important. It's not only a training camp. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a research institution where, where training is folded into a research project. And I think this, this idea of a lifelong learning, a lifelong learning is very, very important, that you, uh, you, you develop critical thinking mm -hmm. skills as well as base skills like coding and computational thinking, thinking in relations and and interdependency networks, which is, I find, also conceptually very rewarding. So I think permatic design isn't only uh, is allowing to do much more complex forms, it is a much more uh, sophisticated way of thinking about an artifact and about a set of spaces, because you're thinking in correlations and networks and dependencies, uh, which is which we could also apply to the brief, you could apply to, uh, to, to the social process. It's just, an, uh, it's just sophistication, full stop. And, and, if we, and, and that is endless rigor, and to have the, the, the intuitive ideas brought to a point and operationalize them through a script is very, very <coughs> healthy. Uh, and and to, to formalize the ineffable and intuitive, that's what I'm doing with the, with the social 
processes. Now look at the humanities going computational. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but there's something called Asian-based computational sociology, which is the cutting edge of sociology. Instead of scratching your head and trying to think through the dependencies of if you change a law here and the population grows this way, what might happen? You set up these dependency networks in the computer and you generate populations which are interacting according to various incentives and rule sets. That's happening in, in sociology, in, 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 in economics, or in, in, in the social sciences as much as in the, in the engineering sciences. So everything, you, you're just participating in a new literacy uh, of our age. And uh, it's a shame that uh, architects have been, in a certain part of architecture, been on the frontier of this. We actually were relatively early in that game. But, but, uh, 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 but not a large part of the discipline. And I think that's, we now falling behind relative to other disciplines. And I mean, the parametric and elect microelectronic revolution and, and data-driven uh, um, thinking and is affecting everything from finance to medicine to engineering. So we should be part, we must participate in this. Any more questions? Uh, here. Uh, actually, if I understood correctly, uh, yeah. parameter talks about the patterns. Uh, may, am I correct? Uh, yeah, patterns play a very large role in this, yeah. Yeah. So there is an author called Ian McCarg, and he had written a book, Design with Nature. And actually on that basis, the software called GIS, which is being used. So there are also patterns which evolve out of the, uh, you also talk about the nature and patterns evolve of the existing situation. So what connect you find between the two? Well, I mean, um, the I'm interested in, in um, social patterns, pattern of communication, pattern of uh, social organization. I'm interested in spatial patterns, and I like, for instance, uh, groups like the Space Syntax Lab. We we have various <coughs> algorithms and measures and mathematics of patterns of spatial patterns, where hidden logics of permeability and relative accessibility are teased out. But then they're working, so they're working analytic patterns, uh, they analyze patterns, but it's also important to invent patterns. So there's also, for me, important that we just go out and look at nature and look at geometry and look at mathematics uh, as, a, as a universe of exploration for potential utilization. So, so we can't deduce the spatial patterns from the brief and from the programmatics and from the social patterns. There is a kind of confrontation of these two, form and function. So I can explore formal universes, pattern universes, um, for a while and then feed them into a kind of comparative analytic process and filter out. But uh, for me, these are, these are, there's a division of labor in terms of formal research and then in terms of utilization and functional research. They're, they're semi-independent, so if you uh, just love the, the variety and curio be curious about all sorts of geometric and, and nature-bound self-organizing pattern, I think that's a very, very, very worthy uh, trajectory of research, and then leave it to somebody else to see how they might be utilized. And you're just offering a kind of universe of exploration. So that's the way I would see it. It becomes, you know, I'm interested in, in um, social patterns, pattern of communication, pattern of uh, social organization. I'm interested in spatial patterns, and I like, for instance, uh, groups like the Space Syntax Lab. We, we have various algorithms and measures and mathematics of patterns, of spatial patterns, where hidden logics of permeability and relative accessibility are teased out, but then they're working, so they're working analytic patterns, uh, they analyze patterns, but it's also important to invent patterns. So there's also, for me, important that we just go out and look at nature and look at geometry and look at mathematics uh, as, a, as a universe of exploration for potential utilization. So, so we can't deduce the spatial patterns from the brief and from the programmatics and from the social patterns. There is a kind of confrontation of these two, form and function. So I can explore formal universes, pattern universes, um, 
for a while and then feed them into a kind of comparative analytic process and filter out. But uh, for me, these are, these are, there's a division of labor in terms of formal research and then in terms of utilization and functional research. They're, they're semi-independent, so if you uh, just love the, the variety and curi be curious about all sorts of geometric and, and nature-bound self-organizing pattern, I think that's a very, very, very worthy uh, trajectory of research, and then leave it to somebody else to see how they might be utilized. You're just offering a kind of universe of exploration. So that's the way I would see it. It's, it becomes, you know, coming, but I wouldn't just rely on it uh, 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 with respect to whole buildings. I guess we have more questions, but uh, we should notice that he has not even had a swig of water. <laughs> and I'm sure. Uh, let, let us spare him for a second, and I still has a question. Yeah. accepted my request and uh, of course I'm going to uh, give you a fantastic news that Patrick has accepted to be the chief advisor of our digital architecture mission. <laughs> because as you all know that we are the loners in India. <laughs> And we keep on fighting for digital architecture. But if you have seen this presentation, so let us please accept that this is the future. Okay. How far we are going to linger in the past? Chadle Makebari. Sorry for the names, because they are the fundamentals, I understand. But Chadle Makebari are the our Bibles and Qurans and Gita. So let's come out of that. And under his able guidance, I am sure that there will be a new parameter added to our uh, mission of spreading digital awareness. Thank you so much for this. And also, I would like to request all of you to please visit our uh, fabrication lab and the newly installed KUKA Robo, which is just now inaugurated at the hands of auspicious hands of I thank and express gratitude to Mr. Patrick Schumacher for an engaging presentation. We have been reading a lot about your works, constructing our arguments based on your theories. Your presence and the illustrated talk made it all come alive for us. I sincerely thank Zahadi Architects London and its representative, Mr. Paolo Mattuzzi and architect Milin Kare, as well as Vishnu Bhushan, for having facilitated the event. Sincere thanks to the event coordinators of 360 Degree Conference and Jasubai Publications for partnering with BNCA. Special thank to Parvez Memon. Sincere appreciations of the hard work put in by architect Mahesh Bangar to make the event a possibility. Thanks to my team at BNCA for everything everybody has done so far. Now we rise for the national anthem. Ayak jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravira utkala banga Vindhya himachal yamuna ganga Utchal jaladitaranga Tava Shubha Nami Jage, Tava Shubha Aashish Maage, Gahe Tava Jaya Gata, Janagana Mangal Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidata, Jaya He, Jaya He, Jaya He, Jaya 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 He, Thank you all. This is not